Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here, my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week. So if you love makeup and you love true crime, definitely hit that notification bell button, hit the like button and make sure to subscribe guys would mean so much to me. So I don't know why I decided to film this video. I actually have a baby shower that I'm going to be going to. So I'm going to keep my makeup a little light, but I hope I'm not going to be sad when I'm <laughs> at this event because today's case before we get into it, I want to thank today's sponsor, HelloFresh. You guys know I love me some HelloFresh, and if you're like me and looking for ways to save, did you know that HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than ordering in? I didn't know that, and it's so much better because all the ingredients I need for each meal are right there organized in each meal kit. I absolutely hate wasting food, especially when you buy too much of one ingredient, like too much broccoli and then it goes bad before you can eat it. I hate that. Good food is too precious to waste and with HelloFresh they give you pre-portioned ingredients which can help cut down on food waste by 23% compared to grocery shopping which is not only amazing for the planet but so good for your bank account. With HelloFresh you get seasonal ingredients that are picked and sent out at their peak ripeness and these ingredients then travel from the farm to your home in less than seven days. So you know they're as fresh as can be. What I also love is that HelloFresh is not just for dinner. They have so many options. So HelloFresh has you covered for all types of meals from snacks and quick lunches to seasonal celebrations and festive gatherings. This was my first time trying one of their desserts and the cake was so good. I don't even like coconut that much, but this cake was so bomb. So go to HelloFresh.com and use code ZARAV50 for 50% off plus your first box ships free. That's HelloFresh.com and use code ZARAV50 for 50% off plus your first box ships free. Thank you so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video and thanks so much to you beautiful people because you guys are amazing. Now I initially just randomly stumbled across it. I was just on some blogs and I ended up reading about this case and I could not stop reading about it. I was just like, is this real? I thought it was fake at first. And I guess with a lot of cases, a lot of us, when we find out about certain cases, what intrigues us the most is we want to know why people do certain things and why they behave a certain way or why they treat other people a certain way. Today's case is about the tragic story of a girl, little girl, who was raised in the most horrific way, something that you would never think anyone would do. In social isolation with little to no human contact, she was mistreated, brutally imprisoned, and she didn't really develop at a normal human pace. What's interesting about this case is this case put the critical period theory to the test. And what that basically is, is when you, when you have a kid, they tell you, you know, the first five years of that child's life is critical to their development. This period or these five years are usually the time that a child will learn the essential things that they require for survival. Like it's in our DNA to grow. The surroundings that they are influenced by impact so many developmental processes, such as hearing and vision and language development and social bonding. So let's get into today's case. So there apparently is a documentary about this case called Secrets of the Wild Child, but for some reason I wasn't able to get access to it. The main researcher, Susan Curtis, stated that the name that they gave to this girl, oh, I haven't even told you the name, Jeannie Wiley is what we're going to be talking about. So the name Jeannie Wiley is not her real name, and it was given in the documentary or in just the research of this case to protect her real identity. And her real name is out there now, but I don't think I'm going to share it. It was hidden for privacy reasons, so I don't know how it got out there, but I'm just not going to be the one to share it. So Jeannie Wiley was born in Arcadia, California in the year 1957. Her father was Clark Wiley and her mother was Irene o Oglesby, I think it is. Now, Irene was from an Oklahoma farming community, but she was apparently a Dust Bowl refugee and she fled to Los Angeles during that time where she met Clark. And I had no idea what a Dust Bowl refugee was. I've never heard that term. So what it is, is during the 1930s, there was a period of severe dust storms that damaged the crops and the farms. So during this time, many of the farmers, they abandoned their farms 
And they packed up all their belongings, all their possessions. They packed up their families into these really old battered trucks. And they, with their families, wandered the country just searching for a new start. Many of them were just looking to work and, yeah, basically just provide and support their families. So that's those people are known as Dust Bowl refugees. Now, during Irene's early childhood, so Jeannie's mother, she suffered a severe head injury which ended up causing some type of mental or neurological damage that would cause one of her eyes to degenerate along with that this neurological damage just was lingering and the eye started having vision problems Jeannie's father Clark he was a former assembly line machinist and he was raised in and out of brothels by his mother. But then in some parts, I also read that he was raised mostly in orphanages. So I don't know if it was a combination of the two, but definitely something to do with both of orphanages and brothels. And this does make sense because this type of childhood had this profound effect on Clark. For the rest of his whole life, he would just fixate on issues with his mother. So this type of lifestyle with his mother clearly left this lingering impact on him. He also apparently resented his feminine first name. And I was like, Clark, how is that feminine? But apparently he did because that first name caused him to be bullied a lot in school. So because of the brothels, because of the childhood that he lived, because of his feminine first name, he really just resented his mother a lot as he grew up. Now, although Clark and Irene, they seemed pretty happy to most people when they first got married, but soon Clark would become controlling and he would prevent Irene from even leaving her home. And then he would subject her to like really horrific beatings. And these beatings as the years went on would just increase in frequency and severity. Now, one thing that makes me really annoyed, Clark never wanted any children. He just never liked kids, never wanted children. And he apparently just hated the noise and the chaos that a child would bring. And I mean, that's totally understandable, but, you know, children are not easy for most. And, you know, you don't just have to like children just because you're a human being. But I don't know what birth control was like back in the day or what society was like. But nonetheless, Clark would end up having children. Now, their first child was a girl. And she was born and everything was kind of okay for the first two months. When she was two months old, Clark decided that he couldn't handle it anymore. He took this baby girl, he wrapped her up in a blanket and he went into their garage and he placed this poor baby inside this dresser drawer in the garage. It was freezing cold and the baby died. The reason why he did this is because this baby girl was crying too much. Oh, Jesus. <sighs> then Clark and Irene have another baby, a baby boy. But this baby, he dies soon after birth because of a congenital defect, apparently. Then soon after that came along Jeannie and her brother, John. Now, obviously, from just those two children, it's clear that Clark was abusive. And although Jeannie's brother, John, would face similar abuse, it would be nothing compared to what Jeannie would go through. So remember Clark, he had this strange relationship with his mother and you know he was a bit of a strange person. I mean, we can tell that from the fact that he put his newborn into a freaking drawer in the garage to freeze to death. But the year after Jeannie was born in 1958, his mother was hit by a drunk driver, which killed her. And that was the thing that completely set him off. The death of his mother seemed to cause him to unravel completely, which you would think because he resented his mother so much, it would kind of put an end to his suffering. But if anything, it caused him to freak out even more. And his resentment towards his mother is what's believed to have caused him to even treat the people around him this way, let alone his own children. This resentment towards his own mother was the root cause for all his anger problems and his subsequent treatment of his daughter, Jeannie. He was already known to be a cruel man, but losing his mother just turned him into something much worse. As if he could get any worse. So Jeannie's brother, John, 
it was older than her. And when he was four, his grandmother, so Clark's mom, when she was still alive, she chose or she took custody of John. And the reason why she did this, and we don't know what she witnessed, but the reason why she did this is she did not believe her son Clark to be a stable parent. So she's like, I'm gonna take custody of my grandson, John. So he was living with her for around two years at this point. So when he was six, Clark's mother, the grandmother, was taking John to get ice cream. They were walking. And as they were walking down the street to get this ice cream, an out of control pickup truck slammed into Clark's mother, killing her. Now John was six at the time and he was with her and he narrowly missed this car. But after the death of his grandmother, he was forced to go back and live with his parents. Now, getting into Jeannie and her life, because at this point when the grandmother died, she would have been, I think, just over one, a few months over one. Um, and I'm going to quickly detail everything that happened to her, just because I don't know if we can all stomach it. And also... There's really not much known about Jeannie's life prior to the abuse. I don't know if she lived a normal life. I don't know if she was loved. Like, I don't, I don't know any of that. So if child abuse and harm against a child is distressing to you, which it is to everyone, but too distressing, please skip through this next part. So because Clark was so deranged, when Jeannie turned or when she was around 20 months old, he decided that Jeannie was mentally disturbed and she would no longer serve a purpose to the society. She was just not valuable. So in his eyes, there was no point in her existing to the world, interacting with the world. That's what he had decided was best for his daughter. So with this decision, he exiled her from society. No one was allowed to interact with Jeannie, not even her immediate family. She, according to Clark, was not allowed to be exposed to any kind of stimulus. Jeannie, for most of her days, oh, was kept locked down in a cold, dark basement most of the time when it was blacked out or in a makeshift cage. Not a crib, a cage. Her father... I don't want to call him her father. He kept Jeannie strapped down to a toddler toilet, okay, a toilet as a sort of straight jacket, you know, or if he put her in the crib, she would be bound to the crib. Her arms and legs were trapped, you know, tied down and she wasn't even potty trained. So I'm just like, was she just going all over herself? Now I said crib, but remember, it's not a crib. I don't know why I said crib. It's made out of chicken wire guys chicken wire and it had like a latch on it the windows were covered with foil to make sure that no sunlight got in the room was super dark it was super cold and genie was kept naked most of the time in a cold dark basement a little the funny thing is clark hated his mom right but the other bedroom in the house okay because they had more space they didn't have to keep genie in the freaking basement but the other bedroom in, a, in the house was more like a shrine dedicated to Clark's mother. It was kept unused and just dedicated to his freaking mother, one that he hated for some reason. But again, her death caused him to become like this. So now I'm guessing there were other bedrooms in the house. I'm not sure what happened to them because the rest of the family, they slept in the living room and this kind of sounds unbelievable but this is what was reported Clark slept in a recliner chair like all night his wife Irene slept in a dining chair on the dining table and John her brother slept on the floor so that that's not torture you know compared to Jeannie but it's still strange Jeannie, when she was restrained for all those days, she had very limited use of her hands and feet. And, you know, everything was dark and the door to the basement, everything was kept shut because Clark didn't want any light to enter that, that room. And it's almost like, was he conducting his own type of experiment? How did he, like, why put your kid in the dark? Like, if you're going to keep them isolated, why do so in the dark? Like, there must have been more to it, but... 
I don't know. He just really wanted to cut her off from any stimulation. Now, obviously this whole case is sad, but one of the saddest parts to me, because I don't know if you're a mom, you'll, you'll understand why. One of the saddest parts is that Clark did not feed or allow anyone to feed Jeannie proper food and liquids. She was only fed cereal and baby food. Baby food that are not solids. Just so you know, my baby is six months old right now, okay? And she's already on solids because that's what's recommended. They're not supposed to, like solids are not really um, necessary, but it's just more for practice and just so they get used to eating you know, like grown up food. Where's the milk? Like she's not getting milk. Well, no, she was over one, wasn't she? So she didn't really need the milk. So then yeah, she needs solid foods guys. Oh my God, sorry. One of the biggest things is that she never chewed. She was given mush. And if she didn't eat the food that they had given to her, they would smear it all over her face, beat her, slap her because they're cruel. Now, as you can imagine, day by day, Jeannie is becoming more and more malnourished. And although she lived with three people in her home, she, oh, breaks my heart. She was barely spoken to. Clark and her brother, John, would only growl at her through the door or like make noises. And her mother, Irene, was only allowed very brief interactions with her own daughter. Now, remember Clark, he hated the fact that babies would make noise so he in general just hated noise so he wouldn't even play any tv or radio in the house the house was just always quiet Jeannie barely heard any sounds no conversations with anyone no outside noises no birds chirping no one had any conversations with her I don't even know if when they would give her the food or tie her up or I don't know what they did to her whether, whether they would talk to her, I don't think they did. I mean, I don't understand how there wasn't even a period of time that we know of where her mother, her father, her brother, like didn't show her a drop of love, affection, something. Wasn't she a cute baby? What about when she was a newborn? Like you'd hate to think that people are allowed to raise human beings in these kinds of environments. Like it's horrible. Clark would hit her with a really large plank of wood for any breach, well, whatever he considered to be a breach that a freaking little baby can do. What what could she do to, ugh. Anyway, he would hit her. For example, if she made any little noise, he would beat her. Now, because he would freaking growl outside her door like a freaking weirder, deranged animal, this obviously caused Jeannie to be afraid of animals. Now, if that wasn't enough, some doctors believe that Jeannie had to have been because she would exhibit some inappropriate behaviors that are just consistent with being abused. And also this behavior would mainly come out when older men were present. So it just seemed you know, likely that this also happened to her on top of everything that she went through already. Now, also because no one would talk to her and this type of isolation, the extent of it also prevented her from even having some type of speech. She had no knowledge of any normal speech behavior. The biggest part in this case is that due to this isolation, she did not develop any language or human behavior. Now, like I said, Jeannie wasn't the only one who suffered abuse, even though hers was the worst. Her brother, John, also did not have, you know, the best childhood. As he got older, he would be punished for his growing sexuality. Yep, something that's normal and natural. And this is really horrific, guys, so just please be warned. Clark would tie oh my God, John's legs to a chair and then use that same wooden plank that he beat Jeannie with and beat and pound on his test because for some reason he thought that was going to help his son. Look, he probably didn't think that. He's probably just a sick 
John later on states that he doesn't think his father wanted him to ever be able to have children and that's why he did that to him. These beatings continue throughout the years for John. Just horrific. And because he beat his son so badly, he would write notes for John to not attend like sporting events or PE class at school so that nobody else would see the bruises on his privates. At that time, they were severely damaged from his father's beatings. Look, the first thing we all question, you know, especially if you're a mom, you're like, where was the mom? Where was the mom throughout all of this? Why did she allow this? Like, you know, it's easy to blame her. And look, I'm one of the first people to be like, where the fuck were you? You know what I mean? Like, it's it's natural. It didn't seem like Irene was involved in the in the cruel treatment in that in the way I mean she wanted to do it. It seemed like maybe she had to do it. Is it just as bad as her not helping Jeannie? But we don't know what it's like in an abusive household unless you've been through it. Again, also the fact that she had that neurological damage and she was, you know, almost blind or le I think she was legally blind in one eye. She stated later on that those were the reasons why she didn't help Jeannie. She claimed that she just felt she couldn't intervene on her daughter's abuse. Now, her mother wasn't completely useless because... We're about to reach some sort of happiness, I guess. In 1970, Jeannie's mother, Irene, decided that, okay, that's that. I need to do something about what's going on. It was time to get some help. So Irene escaped to her parents' home. And on 4th November 1970, she went in search for a place that was supposed to help the legally blind. And this place was supposed to give, like, welfare and aid to people that were legally blind. So she brought along Jeannie with her and apparently she stumbled into the wrong room. She stumbled into the offices of social services. And obviously when she got in there, a social worker took one look at Jeannie and she was like, oh, something's not right. Jeannie was stooped over a shrunken little girl who apparently she held her hands up like a bunny. And I'm guessing she was doing this, like, you know, like, like a bunny. And look, if you really think about that, that's almost like a protective mode. Like you're kind of doing this because you, something's going to happen to you. It's really sad. She looked about six or seven years old and all the welfare officers were just like mesmerized by her because they had never seen a child looking like her. And at first they were just like, okay, looks like she has autism. Then as she spent a little bit more time in the office, they discovered like, oh my God, this little girl, she can't even talk. They also discovered that she was incontinent and she salivated a lot and she spat a lot. One thing that I find incredible because it just tells you about the human body, she had two nearly full sets of teeth. And when I read that, I was like, oh, okay, like, yeah, we all do. But no, she had like back and front, like her baby teeth and some adult teeth. And this type of condition is super rare. It's known as supernumeraries. It's a very, very rare dental condition. And can anyone guess why this even occurred to Jeannie or happened to her? I'm sure some of you did guess. It's because she was only fed mush. She was fed baby food. She never developed the the behavior of chewing and allowing her teeth to fall out. Chewing harder food is what triggers your body to make your teeth fall out, your baby teeth. She had never had that experience. She could barely chew or swallow. She also could barely see and she couldn't extend her limbs fully, which is just so sad. I mean, guys, how can she learn to focus her eyes or use her vision correctly if she is in a dark room majority of her time? Her eyes cannot adjust to lighting and different colors and things like that. There's nothing to focus her eyes on. She weighed just 59 pounds, 26 kilos. And once they found out that she was actually 13 years old, they were like, what the hell? The social workers immediately tipped off police about Jeannie once they noticed her strange, odd behavior. 26 kilos, my goodness, my goodness me. I'm pretty sure my four-year-old is, and he's like on the skinnier side, and he is 15, 16 kilos. 
And he's four. Now, upon Jeannie's discovery, police immediately admitted her to the hospital, the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, and she was evaluated. She was severely underdeveloped. She looked like a child that was six or seven years old. She behaved like one even younger. She couldn't even stand up straight. She walked in like this hunched stature and she almost seemed like an animal to the researchers. She only walked with this bunny walk as they call it and she couldn't really recognize any words. The only words she recognized were her name and the word sorry. Shortly after being at the hospital, they evaluated her and they determined her social skills and her development to be that of a one-year-old. She was 13. Now, one of the first things, and I'm guessing Jeannie's mother gave this information, Jeannie did not begin walking at the age of one. And look, there's no like right or wrong age for stuff like that. I mean, kids if they don't hit a certain milestone yes they get evaluated but my son didn't begin walking till I think he was 15 months old so 12 months is one year so he was 15 months old so just like a few months after one like give give them a freaking chance you know so with Jeannie she didn't start walking by the age of one so her father was like oh something's wrong with her throw her in the bin so because she didn't you know walk at one, her father thought she was developmentally disabled. But when researchers looked into her history, they were like, we never found any history before 20 months old of mental illness, autism, any kind of disability. There was nothing. Therefore, they came to the conclusion that the impairments that Jeannie had suffered was caused by her father, caused by the isolation and deprivation she was subjected to. The wild thing is police found meticulous logs that Clark had been keeping of his treatment of Jeannie. He would write down every time he locked a window, locked a door, you know, closed this thing, closed that thing. Like he wrote everything down. He was a total dictator. He his word was law. He was a total dictator in that household. The police state that even Hitler could have taken notes of him. That's how bad he was. Now, by the time Jeannie was discovered, something clearly clearly had to have been going on at, around that time when she was 13, because not only did Irene escape, you know, a few months before that, but John, he had just turned 18 and he also fled the home because of his father's increasingly violent behavior. Now, upon her discovery, both of Jeannie's parents were charged with abuse, but Clark, by that time, Jeannie was 13 or a little bit older. He was old, he was 70 years old. And do you guys wanna know something really unsatisfying? The day he was supposed to appear in court for his treatment of Jeannie, he committed suicide. Yeah, like most of them do. He was such a son of a... He left his funeral clothes laid out on the bed, okay, for his family to come and take care of him. He also left two notes and $400 for his son, John. The note to John said, be a good boy now. I love you. Another note that was left, which I think was in regards to Jeannie, stated the world will never understand. Which let me tell you is such a cop out. I mean, you don't do these things to your own child and it's the world's problem. It's the world's problem that you mistreated your child and we are the issue for thinking that it's wrong. You had no issue harming a two month old baby, let alone a 20 month old baby. What, what did a 20 month old mean to him if a two month old didn't mean jack shit? Some people really don't deserve to procreate. They really don't. And yet they do. They're the ones that end up having the children and people who really want kids aren't able to freaking have children. His note stated, no one will ever understand. But the fact that he committed suicide, doesn't that make you think that he knew what he was doing or what he did to Jeannie was wrong? Why commit suicide? If the world wouldn't understand and you were in the right, the world's wrong, where'd you go? Where'd you go, Clark? Now, as you can imagine, Jeannie's case really drew a lot of attention to it. There was a great interest from the research community because they had never been privy to someone, a human being treated the way that Jeannie was treated. It was such a rare opportunity to have a subject like her. The researchers wanted to undertake Jeannie's case because they wanted to see, okay, is it possible 
for someone to now begin develop developing at the age of 13 years old after you know being subjected to years of this torture and i mean researchers would never intentionally do that to someone they would never intentionally raise a baby and do that so this was considered such a rare opportunity for them so unfortunately genie's super rare case was up for grabs the national institute of mental health provided funding for the team to research into genie's case and a team was assembled to rehabilitate and study Jeannie's behavior. Jeannie soon learned basic skills like going to the toilet and dressing herself. Poor Jeannie, she was so fascinated by her environment and wanted to learn. She would study it immensely and she especially loved to be outside the hospital. She liked to go into the outside world, as you can imagine. She was pretty talented at non-verbal communication, but actual verbal communication she struggled with and she couldn't pick it up as easily. As a result, the psychologist David Riggler, he decided to focus his main efforts on Jeannie's language development. Now, I'm really not gonna cry or try not to cry at this next part because I'm gonna read to you an example of how Jeannie spoke. <sighs> oh my God, okay. So she would say these things often and this was an example of it. Father hit arm. Big wood. Genie cry. Not spit. Father. Hit face. Spit. Father hit big stick. Father is angry. Father hit genie big stick. Father take peace wood hit. Cry. Father make me cry. She had spent 13 years living this way, guys. And you know, like, if I... I'm, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty patient person. Like I never was, but somehow when I had kids, I became super patient. And if I lose my patience, if my son is just annoying me and I've been pretty patient with him and he says something and I'm like, Carter, stop it. Like I get frustrated immediately. I feel horrible, like so horrible just to see his little face. Like, like he gets so upset. Um, and I know discipline and stuff needs to be there and that's normal in life, but I'm talking about like, just, you know, seeing your kid be upset is sad. It breaks my heart so much. Do you know how hard that statement was for me to read? Like it's, it's just words, right? But now picture it that there, there's a person behind this saying that. And it's like that person has experienced something so horrific that we will never understand. And I hope no one ever has to understand that. It's just the most horrific. It's the most horrific thing. I think what's wild about this statement is that, okay, in the first five years of human development we develop right like we learn certain things crucial to our existence this statement that Jeannie made was at 13 14 years old and I mean she didn't receive any love any affection any interaction no playing you know the first five years they stayed you need to play with kids really play with them because that's how they learn playing is their form of education not receiving any love any kindness someone to play with her like she doesn't even know what that is because she was never given it. Playing with children is so crucial to their minds, to their hearts, to their souls. Like no one played with her. It makes me so sad. And what makes me even sadder is that even though this was the life that Jeannie knew, that's all she knew, she still knew how to cry. Oh my God. Because that tells you that us as human beings, our feelings, they're real. You can't control that. She can't control. I mean, she was subjected to that for so many years. She should have learned to just not cry, right? No, she still cried. She cried from the pain. She probably cried from being treated that treated that way. Like, even if she didn't know that that was wrong, oh, it just breaks me. It breaks me. So they also called this experiment um, Jeannie the feral child experiment. And at first I was like, so rude. How the, Like, you're going to call her feral child? Because in Australia, like, We'll say, like, I've heard people be like, oh, my child's a little feral. Like she's being a little feral. She's being feral today. You know, it's like, kind of like an insult. But in this case, feral child is a human child who has lived isolated from human contact from a very young age. And so has had little or no experience of human care, behavior, or human language. It can be due to an accident, fate, or even human abuse and cruelty. So that's the reason why they called this experiment that because they were going 
based off that definition. Now, within the first seven months of her discovery, Jeannie learned many new words. She had even begun to speak, but she still spoke in just single words. By 1971, Jeannie could put together two word sentences. And later that year in November, she could put together three word sentences. Now, just a side note that tells you how affected she really was because I remember with my son, I, you know, was reading to him and things like that. They pick up things like that in a week. No lie. They literally can pick up, like, I can be like, ball, ball, ball. He won't know what the hell a ball is. And then, like, the next day he's like, ball. And he'll and everywhere he sees, he's like, ball, ball. Like, he'll just know. And it took her that many months. So that clearly tells you that the human brain, when you're young and developing at that age, it's crucial to continue developing at that young age and not at the age of 13. Now, despite this progress of two word sentences, three word sentences, Jeannie never learned to ask questions and she never really understood grammar. And that is something that would happen to humans on like a daily language basis, right? Like when you're talking to your mom, dad, that's just what you learn. But trying to teach her that at that age, it was just a struggle. Like I said before, after learning to speak in these two word, three word sentences, children normally develop a language explosion where they suddenly blab, like I said, ball, and then he'll be like ice cream and things like that. Like he'll just, it's it's quick, you know, it, they develop at this like rapid speed, which is what the explosion is. But Jeannie never experienced such an explosion. She kind of just plateaued at this three word sentences like level and this plateau lasted four years she had four years of consistent help and work people working on her but that's where it plateaued she could convey like simple words or things that she wanted she'd be like applesauce buy store like she knew to buy the applesauce at the store but more sophisticated um, sentence structures were out of her grasp and the researchers concluded that the thought is different from language. Does that make sense? So you can think something, you can think like, okay, well, can you pass me that light? But our language cannot keep up with the speed of our brain. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So Jeannie, during this research, demonstrated, demonstrated that it is possible for a human to learn language beyond that critical five-year period, yet her inability to learn grammar, which they believe is the key to human language, indicated that passing the critical period, the five-year period, was detrimental to language acquisition. It was just not going to be either possible or easy. Now, Jeannie had a thirst for learning and she was also highly communicative, but that whole language versus grammar barrier was just something they could not break. They said that she was actually really smart. She could like hold a set of pictures and tell you a story from it. She could build really complex structures from sticks. She had other clear signs of intelligence and that the lights were definitely on. She almost was an expert in nonverbal communication. She could express what she wanted to people around her. And that's even without being able to speak to them directly. One of the psychologists re remembered that one time there was a father walking with his son and the son had a fire truck with him and they just passed Jeannie and Jeannie was looking at them and they just passed and then the boy just stops turns around and hands his comes back and hands his fire truck to Jeannie and Jeannie never asked for it she never said a word but it was clear that she wanted it and that's just how she was able to somehow communicate it was almost like man magical during Jeannie's treatments there were quite a lot of disputes between the members of her team she had quite a lot a large team in the early days after her discovery she first was fostered by a teacher named Jean Butler and Jean felt that Jeannie was being subjected to too many treatments and she attempted to change Jeannie's treatment plan on her own she wouldn't allow the linguist Susan Curtis remember that original one or the psychologist James Ken into her home to see and treat Jeannie other people claimed that Jean did this because she believed that Jeannie was going to make her famous and she wanted to keep her all to herself. She wanted to get all the credit and she actually applied to be Jeannie's permanent foster parent, but that was rejected. The psychologist David Riggler and his wife then stepped in and fostered Jeannie and they were with her for the next four years. They continued to work with her and they also let other researchers work with Jeannie. However, Jeannie had to leave this foster home after the four years because the National Institute of Mental Health stopped funding her research. And this was due to some type of error with data collection. I couldn't really find much more about that. Throughout the years that Jeannie was being 
I guess, helped but researched on. There were so many questions on whether someone like her, a patient, could be a patient but also be tested and research conducted on. How could she be a research subject and rehabilitator at the same time? The lines were so murky and they were crossing. In 1975, Jeannie's mother, Irene, regained custody of her because her she was acquitted from all the abuse child abuse charges but she couldn't care for Jeannie it was too much work and then Jeannie ended up being bounced foster home to foster home and once again I don't know how this happens she was subject to abuse at these foster homes she was beaten for vomiting and you know because she wasn't like a normal 13 year old and due to this abuse again she regressed badly. Soon she stopped talking and she refused to even open her mouth. She never regained the progress she made. Which is so ridiculous to do to this poor, poor lady, poor girl. You do all this to help her, subject her to all this bullshit involuntary testing, and then only to just end up back at square one. What was the, what was the point? She was better off just being in a hospital being treated like meanwhile Jeannie's mother filed a lawsuit against the researchers and the children's hospitals stating that they prioritized their research over her welfare which she's kind of right she contended that they pushed Jeannie to the point of exhaustion and the case was eventually settled and the debate still continues some people believe that the researchers exploited Jeannie and that they didn't help her as best as they could but then some people are saying well they were researching and they were treating Jeannie to the best of their ability, what else were they supposed to do? A historian and a psychologist, Harlan Lane, made a statement saying that there's an ethical dilemma in this kind of research. If you want to do rigorous science, then Jeannie's interests are going to come second some of the time. If you only care about helping Jeannie, then you wouldn't do a lot of the scientific research. So what are you going to do? Now, I couldn't find information about Jeannie now in 2023, but as of 2019, Jeannie was believed to be still alive and living in an adult foster home as a ward of the state in California still. Now, that linguist, Susan Curtis, Curtis, she claims back then that she really tried to get in touch with Jeannie and rekindle with her, essentially. But she's been repeatedly rejected that Susan states that she has tried and tried and tried, but she's never been able to get in touch with Jeannie. She says that when she contacts the authorities that are with Jeannie, that they tell her, yeah, Jeannie's fine. She's doing well. Yet when this journalist, Russ Reimer, said he saw Jeannie at her 27th birthday, he refutes that claim. And then this other psychiatrist, uh, Jay Shirley, he saw Jeannie at her 27th and her 29th birthday. And he also agrees with that other guy stating that Jeannie does not look well. She looks withdrawn and depressed. Jeannie's brother, John, has been interviewed a few times and he obviously witnessed a lot of the abuse. And he states that he feels that maybe God failed him or he failed God. And he states that the last time he saw Jeannie was 1982 and he lost touch with his mother and she died in 2003. And this part makes me sad. He says, he says that he just tried to put Jeannie out of his mind because it just brings him a lot of shame. Maybe he couldn't cope with helping her. Maybe he had to live his own life. Who knows? He states that he's glad that Jeannie got some help um, and he actually dealt with a few brushes with the law. He finally settled in Ohio and he worked as a painter. He married and had a daughter named Pamela, but the marriage didn't survive and his daughter Pamela turned to drugs. In 2010, police found um, John's daughter Pamela. She was really intoxicated and she was charged with endangering her two daughters, Jeannie's nieces. Now, you would hope that this would have a happy ending, but really doesn't. There was no turnaround. John, he had diabetes and he died in 2011. Pamela, his daughter, who apparently never met her aunt Jeannie, died the following year in 2012, leaving those two daughters behind. And Jeannie Wiley's story is just one of the saddest stories you will ever hear. And it leaves behind more questions than it does give you any answers. So though Jeannie was unable to really learn language, she was able to communicate in so many other ways through art, through music. And she had this innate ability to communicate without even speaking. She had done all this in a safe environment. 
if she had stayed in a safe, stable home with help continuing on her treatment, what would she have become? We don't know what her progress would have been if adequate care was not taken away from her. Why did her funding stop? You know, I mean, she didn't even need to just constantly be experimented on and researched on. They could have literally just given her a safe, stable home, even if it had to be in a hospital. That's better than what she ended up in. This case really puts forth the question of how we deal with and treat and care for child abuse survivors and learn about them without exploiting them. Again, Jeannie's story doesn't have a happy ending. She went from one bad situation to another. I feel like she was failed by all those who were supposed to be caring for her. I hope whatever she ended up in, if she's still alive, that she received some sort of care, love, happiness. I hope she at least experienced that sometime in her life. So guys, let me know your thoughts on today's case. I know it's a pretty gloomy, doomy one, but you know, we need to talk about these things. And I'm so glad you guys are with me on this journey into sharing these cases. And thank you so much for your support. I will see you in the next one. Besitos. Bye. Mommy. Hello. You want to use it? Okay, use it here on my chin. Thank you. You want to show it? Come closer to me. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Thank you, buddy. Mm. <laughs> Thanks. Um.